I just know we're not going to allow the band to do it all by themselves. I know we're just not going to let the band do it all by themselves. I, I, I know that that wasn't a cue for them to stop because there's, you heard me say, you heard me say that uh, there is a Hebrew word, zamar. Zamar. And a zamar praise is what they do. A zamar praise is praising them, praising him on the instrument. And so when they're over there, they're not doing that for our entertainment. They're giving praise unto God. And it's for us to find our spot. It's for us to find our spot. Not where they are, but where we should be. They're doing what they are gifted to do. God has given you a praise from you to him. You have a praise for God. And that's why we're here today. Somebody say amen. Amen. Why, I'm going to ask the, why, you, why you're standing, that you remain standing. Those who are not standing, please stand. I want to give you a news flash. I know that this is Memorial Day weekend, but we didn't come here for a memorial service. Okay, I'm going to say it again because they didn't get it right down in here. I know that this is Memorial Day weekend, but we didn't come here for a memorial service because Memorial is paying tribute to those who have transitioned and not to return. Our Savior transitioned and he returned. So this is not a memorial service. So that means you don't have a memorial praise. I'm not expecting you to come by and pay tribute and keep going. Somebody say amen. If God has done anything for you, in the last 24 hours, why don't you give my hand a praise? If he really blessed you in the last week, somebody ought to give him a shout. If he brought you out of trouble, somebody ought to give him a hallelujah. And if you have the spirit of expectation to meet him here today, somebody ought to say glory. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Our scripture this morning is found in 2 Peter chapter 1 starting in verse number 2 2 Peter chapter 1 starting in verse number 2 say may God I'm living I'm reading from the New Living Translation it says may God give you more and more grace and peace as you grow in your knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord verse 3 says by his divine power God has given somebody say has given God has given us everything we need for living a godly life we have received all of this by coming to know him the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence and because of his glory and excellence, he has given, somebody say has given, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enabled you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. Saying this, or it says, in view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Sub supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence and moral excellence with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with patience endurance and patience endurance with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love for everyone. The more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But those who fail to develop in this way are short-sighted or blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their old sins. You will hear, we heard on Wednesday night, you will hear today, and you're going to hear from the, from the rest of this summer, since Memorial Day is the unofficial beginning of the summer, that God has called all of us to a standard of divine excellence. Divine excellence. Therefore, God expects, somebody say expects, God expects us to be excellent. 
He's not asking us to pursue excellence. He's not asking us to talk about it. He's, he has an expectation upon each and every one of us. So today, we just gonna, we're just going to uh, kick down the door of the thinking that we cannot be because I'm only human. That is a lie straight from the pit because the scripture says that God has given, past tense, you, me, everything we need. Everything you need. Everything you need. Say, I have everything I need to be excellent. So we invite your excellent selves and excellent spirits to the altar this morning. And when you come, come with those excuses come with what Satan has told you why you cannot be excellent you're not dumb you're not stupid you're not no good see those are the lies that you've been told you're not tore down you're not toe up you're not you're not you were not created to be an addict You have not done anything that God did not know about. Therefore, everything that you've been walking around saying that you are is a lie. How do I know? Because the scripture just said God has given you everything you need. You're not lazy. You're not a dog. You're not fast but you are a child of God. You are a child of the Most High. You are a king, you are a queen. You do have a purpose. God has a plan for you. God said, I know the plans I've had for you, plans to prosper you, plans to help you not hurt you, plans for hope and a future. Somebody right now is rejecting this word over them because you are so accustomed to what you've been told. You, not, you are not even that last mistake you made. You're greater than that. You're greater than that. You're greater than that. You are excellent because you was created to be excellent. We will not, Brother Jay, I need you to come to the altar. We will not allow you to, to, to accept a standard of mediocrity. Say, I am excellent. I need my young people to say that. Say, I am excellent. My God is excellent. I have my God's name. Scripture says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. And then Solomon writes, if my people who are called by my name. So if my father's name is excellent, I'm called by his name. That means my name is excellent. And I'm going to fulfill with expectations the meaning of excellence. So we come against, this is very simple, we coming against everything that's, that's hindering you from being excellent. We come against every demonic seed that's been sown in your past telling you that you're not excellent. You are an excellent woman. You are an excellent mother. You are an excellent sister. You are an excellent queen. You are an excellent child of God. Everything you do is excellent because you got it from your father. You are an excellent brother. You are an excellent father. You are an excellent husband. You are an excellent priest, prophet, protector, and provider. Why? Because God created you to be excellent and you have his name. No longer will you walk with your head bowed down. Just hoping to get by. We counsel out every demonic attack upon your life. Yes, your life may not be where you want it to be, but today you're going to, you will, under the power of God, will sow excellent seeds. Excellent seeds in your home, excellent seeds in your service, excellent seeds in your marriage, excellent seed in, in parenting, excellent seeds with your sibling, excellent seeds for God. Everything you do from this moment forward will be excellent. The Holy Spirit has mandated us as your pastors to hold up a standard of excellence before you as he hold up a standard of excellence before us. 
And it doesn't stop with you. Pass it down to your children. Pass it down to your grandchildren. Pass it down to your nieces and nephews. Pass it down to the children that you're not biologically connected to, but spiritually you are. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask or think according to the power that resides in you. We received this word this morning. We received this prophecy this morning. Prophecy this morning. We received this shift in our atmosphere. In the name of Jesus, we pray. If you receive this by knowing, by trusting, and by faith, give God a hand of praise. Come on, bless his name this morning. Bless his name. Say, I am excellent. I am excellent. I am excellent. Say, I am Excellent. Amen. Good morning, family. I can't hear you. Good morning. Looking beautiful, Raquel. I'm loving that hair. You guys looking beautiful in your green. Yeah. We are culminating our celebration and information on Mental Health Month. As you guys know, one of the pillars of our vision is wellness. And we tackle those issues. So we this month have been getting information and being supportive and understanding what mental health looks like and how to treat mental illness. I have the privilege of introducing our last speaker today. She's actually family. She's my sister in love. She is Janice's baby sister, Dr. Janice's baby sister. She is getting her PhD from Loma Linda University. Yeah. And she is a licensed associate profession, professional clinical counselor. That's a whole lot to say she qualified to talk to y'all this morning. <laughs> so the future Dr. Heather Jones, would you come? Good morning, Royal Priesthood chosen generation, peculiar people. Y'all are amazing. You guys are beautiful. Imani Praise Fellowship, I am so honored to be here this morning to talk to you about one of the facets of mental health that is so important. Self-care, and especially related to caregivers. Before I really dive in, I'm a little cogent, just a little bit. So I really have to just stop and really give honor and praise to God, because without him, I wouldn't be here. Without him, I wouldn't even be in this program to be able to stand before you today, to have the testimony, to have the skills to share this information with you. I also wanna thank pastors Laquetta and Kelvin Simmons for giving me the opportunity to be here to share with you, for trusting the God in me to share perfect, sound information. And when I say perfect, that means mature information, okay? The National Mental Health Alliance for um, Mental Illness, they have these great tools that they have for maintaining healthy relationships um, for caregivers, specifically for caregivers of people who have mental illness. And so I wanna share some of those with you today, but before I dive into that, I should stop moving probably, huh? Okay. <laughs> I want you to know a little bit about how I think about things and how I think about mental health. I believe that we are a spirit, we have a soul, and we live in a body. Our mental health is tied to our soul. We think about, or I think about in 1 Thessalonians, I believe it is, where the author talks about being complete in soul and spirit. And so we have to put as much attention into our souls that we do into our spirit. So by coming to church and praying and building up our faith, we have to take care of our soul too to be complete people, to be able to take care of the people that we love. If we are empty, if we are broken, if we are depleted, how can we 
be strong caregivers. So the tools that I want to share with you today are not just limited to those who are caregivers of people who have mental illness, but they can be translated to all caregivers, okay? Feel free to ask questions or tell me to slow down. I get a little nervous and I start talking fast, okay? So one of the big points in maintaining healthy relationships when you're a caregiver is not buying into stigma. Taking the time to educate yourself on the illness of the person that you are caring for. A lot of times we can get caught up on thinking about how media defines mental illness or any type of illness. We can get caught up on what we were raised to think about mental illness, about depression, about anxiety, about schizophrenia, about adjustment disorders. Educate yourself. Take the time to get information for yourself to know how to care for these people, to understand where they're coming from. You don't want to be ignorant. Knowledge is power, right? Our second point, take the time to understand confusing behavior. I think about maybe children or adults who may not be able to walk through a door because they need to take the time to maybe turn the knob three or four times before they go. Now for a caregiver, you might be thinking, doggone it, James, why can't you just get together? You're embarrassing me right now. But take the time to really understand that behavior, what it's stemming from, and how you can then explain that behavior to others so that they can become more informed, so that you're not putting this child or this person in a box and then causing them to feel less than and it will strengthen your relationship because you're taking time to understand them and they're feeling open to communicate to you as well. Another point, have hope. See opportunities for improvement. Don't take a diagnosis and think that this is the end all be all. There's hope, there's growth, there's, pos there's possibilities for difference. Being able to take the time to grieve maybe the person that you thought this person should be or could be and taking the time to know who they're going to be and who they can be and encouraging them along that path. Another point, it's okay to have boundaries. It's okay to say no. It's okay to set expectations. This is very important. And children that I work with with explosive behaviors, aggressive behaviors, they know. Ms. Heather will no longer talk to you if you are throwing things at me, if you are yelling at me, the conversation has to cease because I can't help you and you're not hearing me. So when you're done, we'll come back. But this is not something that we talk about in the moment. This is something that we talk about beforehand. So having a plan, going back to educating yourself, talking to mental health professionals, talking to the people who are supporting the person that you are caring for so that you can all be on the same page to provide consistency. Another point, communication. This is really important. Taking the time to be direct and clear with your communication. Not using too many words, making sure that you're on the same page, making sure that you're taking the time to understand things from the other person's perspective. Taking the time to Think for a minute, what is it like to be depressed? What is it like to have anxiety? What is it to feel like the world is crashing down around me, but I'm still expected to go to work every single day? I'm expected to care for my family, be in relationship. Take that time so that you're able to then have stronger, more effective communication with the people that you're caring for. Understanding where they're coming from so that you can ask questions so that they feel heard. That is so important. Feeling heard and validated means so much. Your love language does not have to be words of affirmation to feel the positive energy from just being validated. Lastly, I really wanna hone in on self-care. What is self-care? Self-care is whatever it needs to be for you but there's some really key things that you can really implement for yourself, taking care of your body, eating well, exercising, whether that's taking a walk around the block, a walk will do wonders for you, raising your serotonin, your dopamine levels, so that you are better able to think and be interactive with the people that you are caring for.
making sure that you're getting sleep. Sleep is so important. As a caregiver, you may not get the standard six to nine hours that people say you're supposed to get. I don't get that, and I'm not a caregiver necessarily. But taking the time for naps, 30 minutes, whatever the case may be, resting your body so that you may be more alert, more open to the person that you are caring for. One of the last things that I really want to hone in on is taking the time to have time for yourself. It is okay to take a break. It is okay to have five minutes to yourself, whether that's going outside, whether you decide to take a week vacation. It is okay to step back and allow someone else to step in. It can be very lonely as a caregiver with you and this one person all day, every day. You get a lot of just not feeling understood, a lot of feeling isolated, not having people to communicate, depending upon the severity of the illness of the person. Maybe you guys don't even communicate. Maybe they're nonverbal. I don't know what the case may be, but taking that time for yourself and allowing others to be a part of your experience. Community is so important. Do not isolate yourself. Get a part of support groups. It is okay to talk to a therapist and pray. It is really okay. I promise you, God will not be mad. <laughs> I am a firm believer that God put me in this profession for a reason. And therefore, he's going to send me the people that need to hear what I may have to support them. I've had wonderful therapists throughout my time. I'm not broken. I still believe in God. I'm not divided. I'm a whole person. It's okay. It is okay to talk. It is okay to share. It is, you don't have to be silent. Okay? See something, say something. Okay? <laughs> All right, you guys. I think my time is up. I appreciate you. Thank you. Amen, amen, amen. Let's give her a great big round of applause. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Good morning, Emmanuel and friends of Emmanuel. Here are the announcements for Sunday, May 27, 2018. This Wednesday will be the start of a new Bible study on Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. We invite you to join us at 7 p.m. as we are taught the expectations of divine excellence. Also starting next Sunday, June 3rd, will mark the beginning of the Summer of Expectations of Divine Excellence, where every family is expected to do everything with divine excellence. In Matthew 5.48, Jesus said, What I am saying is that you must be perfect, just as your Father in Heaven is perfect. We will move all of our families to the level of excellence by expecting and being excellent. Please join us for Corporate Prayer Daily at 8 a.m. and 8 p.m., except for Sunday morning and Wednesday evening. Call 712-775-7035. Access code is 576-780-POUND. And please remember to place your phones on mute. On Saturday, June 2nd at 1.30 p.m., Leah Crest Realty, in collaboration with Bishop Kelvin and Pastor Laquetta Simmons, will host a four-part series on building your wealth through real estate here at Emmanuel. For more information, please contact Rachel Richardson at 323-829-6586. All singles are invited to join us for the Game Changer Single Retreat on September 28th and 29th in Palm Springs. If you're interested in attending, deposit your due by August 1st. For complete details, please visit our website at www.emmanuelpraisefellowship.org. Emmanuel Praise Fellowship I Care Food Ministry will hold a food drive on Sunday, June 3rd. We're asking members to donate canned goods and non-perishable food items. A list of the desired food items can be found at the hospitality table, or if you prefer to make a monetary donation, please see Mother Bush. 
The manual has started its voter registration drive, and if you're 17 years of age or older and have not yet registered to vote, please visit the hospitality table and register today. The Genius Project Summer STEM Academy registration will close enrollment on May 31st. If you're interested in having your child attend our three-week STEM Concentrated Summer Academy, please visit our website and register before the deadline. Keeping a Sacred and Simple Marriage Ministry Couples Retreat will be held from June 21st through June 23rd in La Quinta. For complete details, including costs and accommodations, please see Deaconess Sam Bishop. Attention all men, coming this summer, a special Bible study, The Cave of the Buddha. All men are strongly invited to attend this time. We will shift our atmosphere once we enter and exit the Cave of the Doodle. We will see you there. And this concludes our announcements for today. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the main event. Let's get ready to rumble! Y'all ready for this? is important our stem program the deadline to register is the 31st we still have spaces if you have 
children, grandchildren, godchildren, neighbors, kids, you want them at this program. We are working with people, payment plans. It costs $50 a week. You can't go nowhere in the summer and put your kid in a program for $50 a week. You just can't, I'm being honest. Not a STEM program, you can't. So we still make it even more affordable for those families who cannot afford that cost. When we were younger, we had to read in the summertime. We, we, my parents did not permit us to just to sit and watch TV. Any bushes in the house? Yeah, we, we couldn't do it. Our kids did stuff over the summer. That's how your kids excel. That's how they get to Morehouse and Spelman. That's how they become doctors. It's because we say summertime is rest, but you still do the work. So go to our website. Register your kids. Is it easy? No, we push your children. We have fun, we go on field trips, but we have a standard of excellence for them. So the 31st is the deadline shared on Facebook. Amen. The other thing is happening on Saturday. When Bishop and I are in a community and we encounter people who have gifts and talents or resources, we want them to be here. So we encountered this um, real estate agency that could help people purchase and get homes. And I know that some of our members and young adults are transitioning into buying homes. So I said, look, I have members who are ready, who are thinking about it, that should be thinking about buying homes. And they said, we can come. I met with them so we can even do more than that. We can train them in real estate if they want a career. We can train, so come on Saturday, anybody that you know. And I'm gonna say something that's gonna be real frank and I, and I don't mean it to be offensive. You are not going to be rich, wealthy, working a regular nine to five job. If you only have one, one income coming into your household, that is difficult. If you're not a Levite, because Levites are supposed to just focus on the work of the, and I mean this kind of Levite, not this kind of Levite. <laughs> that you're supposed to be working on the temple. Other than that, they sh and we try to give you opportunities to have multiple streams. There were four streams feeding the Garden of Eden. Four water streams. That's symbolic of four streams that should be feeding into your household. So that's why we present opportunities. The other piece I was going to say is that because our people get unjustly incarcerated, they get records. Black and brown people get records. I'm just being honest. So they make it even more difficult for us to get jobs. They're going to be living wages. They're going to have to develop a business to get around some of the obstacles that have been put in place of them in order to generate money. Let's just be honest, right? So we present opportunities in real estate and other options for our men and women who've encountered some of those obstacles to be able to take care of their family. We've just been honest. There's another opportunity we're going to be bringing for you as well. But be here on Saturday. Your cousin and them, all of them, <laughs> need to be here. They, it's free. They just want to educate you. And I'm praying that in a year that we're going to have some of y'all going to be owning homes. In the name of Jesus. Owning homes. Real estate. That's our dream for you. But you got to come get educated. You got to clean up your credit. You got to understand what loans and money are. So be here on Saturday. Amen. As the Yule Brenner, Yule, yeah, that's his name, character said in uh, the Ten Commandments, so let it be, so let it be written, so let it be done. What she said, and we, I touch and agree, that's all we need is two, right? That there will be a new homeowner, a couple of homeowners out of this, this uh, seminar because you were obedient to what God just planted in your spirit. If you're not, you're eliminating yourself. But if you are, you put yourself in the running. That's, that's not manipulation. That's just the word of God. Amen? Amen. Real quick, real quick, I want to share this scripture with you. Men, when I say men, every man, and I'm not just saying Levites, 
I'm saying every man. I'm not just saying every member. I'm saying every man. In 1 Samuel chapter 22, starting at verse number 1. In 1 Samuel chapter 22, starting at verse 1, it says this. David left Gath and ran away to the cave of Adullam. David's brothers and relatives heard that David was at Adullam and went to see him there. Many people joined, many people joined David there. Listen to this. These were the men that joined him there. They, there were men who were in some kind of trouble. Men who owed a lot of money and men who were just not satisfied with life. All kinds of people joined David and he became their leader and he had about 400 men with him. I ain't putting your business out in the street, but I guarantee you there's a lot of men who fell in one of those categories. Men who are in some kind of trouble. Men who owe a lot of money. Men who were just not satisfied with their life. I can tell by the men who are not satisfied with your life by the way you conduct yourself, by the way you walk, by the way you talk. You don't, even, you don't even try. Those men don't even try to walk with their head up. We're not going to talk about debt this morning. And this season, I have had more uh, times trying to get men out of trouble then promote them to the next level. Next Sunday begins the special study for the Cave of Adullam. And the purpose of the Cave of Adullam is to move you from the men that was described to the men that David used to win all the wars. <laughs> Brothers, this is where you clap. Okay. Okay. David started with 400, he finished with 600, and those were the men that, that conquered all of his wars. We have been losing too many because of those three categories and then some. So I told the men in our uh, men ministry, if there's, any, if there's ever a time that I'm going to lay the word mandatory, it's this one. Next Sunday at 4.30 it begins. Ooh, Sunday at 4.30. Why Sunday at 4.30? Because every time we try to get you together, Friday, you're not available. Saturday, you're not available. Monday, you're not available. But you're available for the trouble. Therefore, under the unction of the Holy Spirit, we can't play with this any longer. Sunday, June 3rd, we begin. It's going to be two Sundays a month. You're going to get the rest of this scheduled throughout the month. But most of you have received this announcement three or four times on your phone. And you'll receive it for the rest of the week. Please, make your schedules. Pastor, not going to be happy with it. Well, you know I got to. No, you have to change your life this summer. How are we going to lead our households? And we walking around not happy with our lives. Brother, say amen. I need you here. Your family needs you here. And God expects you to be here. Amen? Amen. Let me see if I can make a smooth transition. Say everything is a seed. Everything is a seed. Everybody got it over here, but everybody didn't get it over here. I know. Uh, where's man, man? Come here, man, man, real quick. Come here. Come on. You. I want you to introduce. I know this is different. I want you to introduce somebody to us, okay? Because you, you are our seed. You hear that? All right. You are our seed. In introduce your special guest today. Emmanuel Jenkins Poole. No, your guest. <laughs> Did you invite somebody here today? Is she here? Okay. Introduce her. Miss Morales. Miss who? Miss Morales. Miss Wise. Miss Wise, could you please stand? Okay, y'all treat my boy Emmanuel Cole right now. 
Who is who is Miss Wise? You said Miss Morales. Say Morales. Morales. That don't say sound like Wise to y'all. Is that Yanni or something else? Okay. <laughs> Miss Morales, I'm sorry. Please stand. This is his teacher. Give me some on that. All right, go sit down. Take that with you. Everything is a seed, you all. If we plant it in our children, they'll do it. And if we do it, it'll, it'll produce fruit. Amen? Amen. When you plant zero, get what you get back. Today, 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 we are excited to participate in seed sowing. Because everything is a seed. Everything is a seed. Dr. Greer, every seed that you have planted in a student is going to come back because every seed produces the fruit that it's supposed to produce. And today, if you want to produce a financial harvest for yourself, you must sow a financial seed. Amen? Amen. Say, everything is a seed. Brother Dozier, everything's good to see you, is a seed. So raise your hand if you need an envelope. Amen. Amen. Bring it on. Oh, we have one over here. My, my wife's going to get one, and, and God's going to give us instruction on how we're going to give because everything is a seed. Er, everything is a seed. Everything is a seed. Can I get a little bit of intentional right there? Everything is a seed, and today we're going to sow intentional seeds into an intentional kingdom so we can receive an intentional blessing. Okay, y'all missed that part. Okay, I'm, I want to help you out. You can spell, you spell a thousand. T-H-O-U-S-A-N-D. Somebody say, I receive. Because that means you sow a thousand. God got to give you back more than you gave him. That's his word. He said, those who sow sparingly shall receive sparingly. But those who sow generously shall receive generously. Amen. Everything is a seed. It's a seed. And God says, I, I, he's asking us, he's expecting us to give at least 10% of our increase. 10% of our increase. That means, Brother OG, your, 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 your tithes right now should be $3,500. Say, I receive. Amen. Y'all do the math. That's $35,000 he was just blessed with. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you need an envelope, raise your hands, hold your hands up. Hold your hand up. I think Brother Andre at the, on the camera need an envelope. Anybody else need an envelope? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask the, the music ministry, as soon as you give, come to the stage. Those of you who are watching us on live stream, you may sow by going to our donate button. And you can sow through our website. And for those who like to give electronically, boy, that line is long already. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Break her machine by your money. You can give electronically, electronically in the back where, where Sister Regina is. Everybody hold up your seed. Here at Emmanuel Praise Fellowship, you can sow, you can give your seed and put it in the baskets where the ushers are, or you can place it on the altar and bless it yourself. Gracious God, our Father, we thank you for this time of sowing. God, we thank you that you have given to us. Now we're going to keep the giving going. We're going to give it back to you so you can give back to us, so we can give back to you, and you can give back to us because that is your word. You said, if we give unto you, you should give back to us good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, that you will pour into our bosom, and we receive by being obedient. Bless us, God, as we move forward during this time of sowing. Everybody repeat after me. Say, my seed shall exceed my need. Come forth.
consigo I said that all things are working for my good, yeah, cause he's intentional, oh, oh. never failing. I know that all things are working for my good, yeah, he's intentional, oh, oh. never failing. Y'all sing all things are working for my good, cause he's intentional. And he's never failing. All things are working for my yeah. Cause he's intentional, yeah. Say oh. That all things are working for my good, yeah, cause he's intentional, never failing. I know that all things are working for my good, yeah, he's intentional, never failing. All things, all things are working for my good, cause he's intentional. And he's never failing. never failing. All things are working for my yeah. my yeah. Cause he's intentional, yeah. He's intentional. Never, failing. never failing. All things are working for my yeah. He said, All things are working for my good. All things are working for my good, yeah. All things are working for my good. Cause he's intentional. He's intentional. And he's never failing. He is. He's intentional. And he's never failing. I know that all things are working for my good, yeah, he's intentional, never failing. I know that all things are working for my good, and he's intentional, never failing all things, he's intentional. And he's never failing. All things are working for my yeah. Cause he's intentional, say. And he's never failing, yeah. All things are working for my yeah, yeah. He's intentional. All things are working for my good, yeah. All things are working for my good. Cause he's intentional. He's intentional. And he's never failing. He is. He's intentional. And he's never failing. So I don't have to worry no, cause it's working for me, yeah, he's working for me, yeah, and I believe that he's working for me, said I can smile again and say that I don't have to worry, no, 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 cause he's working for me, yeah, he's working for me, yeah, yeah, yeah. he's working for me, said I don't have to worry no, he's working for me, he's working for me, he's working for me, Say so I don't have to worry, no, 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 no. He's working for me. He's working for me. He's working for me. Say so I don't have to worry, no, 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 no,
is working for me. Cause he's intentional. He's intentional. Yeah. And he's never failing. He is. He's intentional. And he's never failing. Said I don't have to work off. It's working for me, yeah, yeah. It's working for me, yeah. And I believe it is working for me, yeah. Hey, I don't have to worry, no, I don't have to worry, no, no, it's working for me, yeah. He's working for me, yeah. I believe it, he's working for me. Say I can smile again, cuz he's working for me. He's working for me. He's working for me. So I don't have to worry, no, 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 I don't have to worry, because he's working for me. He's working for me. He's working for me, yeah. So I don't have to worry, no, 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 because he's working for me. It's working for me. It's working for me. It's working for me. I don't have to worry, no, 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 no. It's working for me, yeah, yeah. It's working for me. Cause he's intentional. He's intentional. Said he's never failing. He is. He's intentional. Said he's never failing. Said whoa. He's intentional. He's intentional. He's intentional. I want, if you are 12 years old, I want you to stay 13, excuse me. If you're 13, I want you to stay in this space. If you're 12, I want you to leave because of the subject matter. But if you're 13, I need you 13 and up to be in this space. Every teenager needs to be in this space. Every young adult needs to be in this space. Amen. Gracious God, we come thanking you for being an intentional God for being deliberate, that we can find you in every detail of our life, God, if we pay close attention. So we ask, God, that you will continue to sanctify this space, that you will send a double portion of anointing, that everywhere we turn, everything we hear will be under your influence, that you will clear our minds, God, that you will clear our hearts, that we will be open to receive the word as you will have us to hear it. We are humbled to be here today, God, and we ask that you will move mightily, that you will slow me down, and that everything that comes out of my mouth will be clear, and that people will hear it the way you want it to be heard. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Before you sit down, beloveds, I'd like for us to read the affirmation together. An affirmation is a declaration of something that you want to come to pass, a statement of what you are agreeing to. So this is why we have you to read this before the word goes forth. So could you guys start today? Amen. So we're going to be um, opening with two scriptures. One I'm going to give you in two different translations. So we're going to be coming from Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 to 21, and then we're going to be at 1 Chronicles, 1 Corinthians 6 and 12. And Galatians says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contention, jealousy, outbursts of rage, selfish ambitions, desertions, heresies, 
envy, murders, drunkenness, rivalries, reveries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. We go down to Corinthians. It says, I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. So the easy to read version, I want to make sure you guys heard this one real plain. I am allowed to do anything you say. My answer to this is that not, that not all things are good. Even if it's true that I am allowed to do anything, I will not let anything control me like a slave. You may be seated. So today we're going to be talking about God, cannabis, and mental illness. She's like, did she say weed? She gonna talk about weed today? We're gonna talk about weed today. Cannabis, marijuana, whatever you wanna talk about it, we're gonna have some real conversation about weed today. But before we get into that, I think it is real clear, I wanted to share this illustration with you, that they are generalist physicians. They're internists that treat the entire body. So that's where you go to first. You go and you see your primary care physicians. Then there are specialists. So in your visit, they notice that you have a heart murmur or you do a urine test and they think there's something in your kidneys and they send you to a specialist, right? So you go to cardiologist. If you have issues with your heart, you go to a pulmonary, some with your, yes, for your lungs something wrong with your kidneys, urology, all of that. They're specialists. And the foot doesn't get mad that the heart needs to go see a specialist. The brain is not upset if there's issues with the kidney and the kidney needs special attention. The body of Christ is made up of various different types of components and various different types of people. And we can't be offended if God is saying there is an issue with the body of Christ, that this part of the body is under attack. So for African Americans and people of color that are part of the body of Christ, we have a special attack on us. And we have been called as specialists to address that part of the body of Christ. When we stand up and fight for and against those things that oppress people of color, black and brown people, we're not being ungodly. We're actually operating in divine order. Because if any part of the body is under attack and we ignore it, then we are being, um, we are being, that's, that's operating in insanity that there is something under attack in your body and you avoid the specialist to get it done. It's like having a heart condition and knowing you have a heart condition, but you don't want to offend your kidneys, so you don't go see the specialist. So Emmanuel Praise Fellowship, we have been charged to attack the things that is attacking us. And the entire body of Christ is better for that if we as a people and people of color are healed. But healing doesn't come place until we happens until we understand what is attacking us and killing us. And part of what we do at Emmanuel, we bring attention to our specialty. Can we deliver a baby? Absolutely. Cardinologists can deliver babies. They can draw blood. They can prescribe prescriptions. But this is our specialty. So Mental Health Month, we've been focusing on those things that have been attacking African Americans and people of color. Because we have come to realize that there is a stigma that has been attached to that, that is causing us not to get the help that we need. Because of racism and white supremacy, it causes our worldview to be tainted 
And that thing that we perceive is good for us is not because we are viewing it through a different worldview. And we have to be conscious at all times from which ear we are hearing information and what we are viewing, what, what, what vessel we are receiving that. If we, we are unwise and, I can't think of another word, stupid. I can't, I can't think of it. I was trying to be more eloquent, but I couldn't. To believe that we are born in this country and we do not have a, a viewscape that is not created for us and handed to us based on the racism that we experience. That everything, because we're born here, how we've been raised, what we have been fed, if we have not been conscious about how we've ingested, that we give it back to ourselves and each other as though it is medicine and it is not. A year ago, God gave me a message that said, your medicine is making you sick. I'm not sure if some of you guys remember that message. And he had me say that some of the things that you were taking to relieve your pain, that you were taking to soothe and relax yourself, any behavior, even any relationship that you were putting in place of God to find comfort in was your medicine. And that medicine that you were taking was causing you to be sick. So as I was reflecting back on that word, and for, I would say, three or four months, having discussions and studying about the impact of marijuana has on people, and I kept saying, God is going to have me preach that word, and today is that day. There's some terms I want to pull up, so as I talk, we'll be on the same page with those definitions. So you're going to hear me talk about um, psychoactive drugs, and those are drugs that affect the chemicals that's in your brain function. It alterates um, your perception, your mood, your consciousness, your cognition, and your behavior. So we're going to talk about uh, psychoactive drugs. That's the term I'm going to use. I gave you other um, psychopharmaceutical. I give you some other terms, but I'm going to be using psychoactive. The next term you're going to hear me say is self-medicating. And that's when we use um, a substance, drug, or alcohol to mask a symptom of mental health issues. So we're going to talk about that. Then the next word is the Greek word that you can find in the Greek lexicon. And the lexicon is nothing but a Greek dictionary. And it's called phar pharmakia. And it is called, um, what well, we know, what word comes for that? Pharmacy. And in this definition, there's four, but the first definition is the use of drugs and the administration of drugs. So those are some terms that we're going to be using. And it's okay, you guys, to raise your hand and say, you know, Pastor, I got, I got a question. So we have heard throughout this month that when we are going through trauma or when we experience some mental health crises, if those have not been identified, then we have lived our life looking for other things to soothe the pain of the mental illness. That many drug addictions are a cause of um, trying to soothe bipolarism or depression or anxiety. And that the trauma that we have experienced, particularly as a people, that it, it can be understandable why we are trying to soothe that pain, right? And because we are under constant stress, one thing I found when I was in Africa that I did not realize was that I did live under constant stress when I got, when I'm here. So even when I walk into a store to shop, I am conscious of who's watching me because they believe I'm going to steal something. I am 52 years old and a minister, probably making more than the clerk. And they're still looking at me as though I'm going to steal something. 
So under that constant understanding of what I'm looking like, and being a black man is worse. You get out your car and people grabbing their stuff. You could be dressed in a suit, walking in a hospital. John could be having his suit on and have this doctor label where people are still thinking that he ain't supposed to be there. Our kids, our little boys, we constantly tell them, don't pick up nothing because I don't want nobody to think you're stealing stuff. But they see other kids picking up toys, looking at it in the store, but we're telling our kids, don't do it. There's a message that even the police, you're not safe. That even if you're getting pulled over for a ticket, there's a level of stress and trauma you feel being pulled over by a ticket. And so we are constantly living under that. When I went to Africa, that lifted, and I did not realize how much that impacted my well-being until I was outside of that space. Anyone that went can attest to that. The moment that we got back into Europe and the looks began again, I said, my Lord. So I would be remiss not to say I understand the need to sometime to want to self-medicate. But I also will be doing you a disservice to tell you that that is okay. That this whole month and our whole pillar of wellness is being able to teach you the art of healing each other based on our traditions of being African people that when we begin to grab for things to soothe ourselves that is contrary to our belief of, of being divine people and understanding who we are as being people of color. I want to play this video, it's just three minutes, um, that's gonna transition me in my discussion about cannabis we marijuana a marijuana that would be great but I'm speaking as a physician and as a psychiatrist who has seen the effect of chronic marijuana use and marijuana in our textbooks in psychiatry and in medicine does alter functioning such that I can look at people, look at their eyes, and tell how much marijuana they are smoking. And what I'm saying is that calling it medical marijuana is a trick that is being run on black people. Because black people have high levels of unemployment and high levels of stress. That's different than the white population where you might have white people who are, have jobs, they have income, and they are smoking marijuana. They are smoking it recreationally. They don't have the kind of stress that black people have. And so black people are under 24-7 stress from racism, white supremacy. So black people are treating the stress by continuing marijuana smoking. They're in a different ballpark and a different level of use. And it interferes with brain functioning. It affects memory. It affects people's ability to learn and to think coherently. And so I say that by saying medical marijuana is just saying to black people, it won't harm you. Now you're going to be in a Bantu stand removed from the urban centers with gentrification. You're not going to have employment. You will be frustrated, but you can have all the marijuana you want and all the marijuana cookies that you want and all the marijuana bread that you want to eat. You can just stay in a continuing state of being high 
because we don't have any use for you anymore. Amen. Okay, so what are some of your reactions to hearing that? I need you, yeah. You see, the game is this. We talk about how they pumped crack cocaine in the inner city. Because a crackhead, um, you can see the effects more vividly. But while, they, while we were talking about crack cocaine, they were slipping in another drug called marijuana. And because we were chill, because they kept telling us there's no harm to that, that there is no effect, which, is, which isn't true, they numbed us. And because they numbed us, that means that we don't resist well. We don't fight back well. We don't say, hey, stop hurting me, because we're numb to the pain. And if they can keep generations of us from fighting back and convincing us that we're taking medical marijuana, then they win. And I'm going to talk... I'm going to talk about some of the effects of that, but it ain't our mama's weed. That's just, it's not the same weed. They're lacing it with heavy metals, glass, fungus and bacteria, PCC, heron, environment fluid, laundry detergent, LSD, cocaine, speed. That's just a list of that stuff. So the goal is to keep us so apathetic that we don't fight for our own lives. And when they come for us and when they come for you, we sit back and laugh and just want to pass the joint instead of understanding that we got some real issues that we can address. Every issue, every pain that we have experienced of people of color, the answer and the solution and the healing lies in us. So if they can keep us high at all times, then they can keep the healing from us. They can convince you that we don't have enough in our own community, and that's a lie straight from the pit. We have enough in us to heal mental illness and to address that issue. We have enough information and understanding of what it means to go within the core of ourselves and get the information from the inside out to begin that process. The doctor that spoke is a psychiatrist. She just passed away maybe, what, 16 months ago, two years, a year and a half ago. Genius. That's who we are. But we don't believe that because we're too high, too in love with alcohol. Not only are we smoking ourselves to death, we're drinking ourselves to death. I want to read you. I have a lot of information. I ain't going to get through everything today. But I, I want to start. This is a book, a poem about marijuana. Someone wrote a whole book. I'm not going to give you the author name because I don't want you to go out and buy it. That was a joke. You know, some people are like, I'm going to buy that book. <laughs> we write poems to people we love. The whole book of Psalms is a poem to God and God's people. We create music based on who we love. And if we are writing poems about marijuana and singing songs, that's a, that is... Um, eye-opening for me. And this poem says, I ain't no shame in my game. No shame, no shame. Ain't no shame in my game. Smoking weed goes with my name. No shame, no shame. Staying high is my aim. Reefer is my nickname. No shame, no shame. When I am stoned, I am tame. Smoking weed has given me fame. No shame, no shame. Ain't no shame in my game. My rapping is filled with flames. I confess I'm awesome, folks proclaim. Ain't no shame, because I ain't got no shame in my game. That's what it does. 
it causes you to not to experience shame. That's what the world does. We're not too ashamed to dress a certain way anymore. We're not too ashamed to disrespect our parents and our elders anymore. We're not too ashamed to smoke outside of the church anymore. We're not too ashamed to... As a people, we have lost a level of respect that is costing us because we refuse to change our view and we don't acknowledge that how we are interpreting the world is not to our best interests. So we want to invite the world in our church looking like the world because we ain't got no shame. Instead of allowing the world to come to us and understand what God looks like and feel like, we do these tricks to bring them in so nothing is beneath us anymore. We tell our kids, our daughters, to respect themselves because they are the temple. But how are you treating the temple? So how we treat the temple with respect is reflective of how they treat themselves. Because we don't show any shame anymore. And that's what engaging in psychoactive medication that is not given to you by the doctor that you're trying to self-medicate, this is what it's doing to you. And we brag about having our medical weed card. As though that's a badge of honor. Now it's legal, we don't need that, but there was a time, you know, I got, I got my card. I ain't breaking the law. Beloved, I say this because I love you with everything in me. That there are things that we are worshiping things that we are ingesting and taking that is not for you. Only because the world says that you can do it, listen to it, eat it, and have it. It is not for you. And you have to make a decision and keep your eyes open and understand how it is destroying you. Before I go into what the Bible says, I read this and it, it just broke my heart. They said that millenniums are the stoner generation. The millenniums smoke more weed than any generation. And I know hippies smoked a lot of weed. So if our young people are smoking more weed than some of us did back in the day, that's alarming. And that is so alarming because the next best of us is in that generation. So if they can take out that generation now, keep them numb, apathetic, keep them uh, addicted, keep them uh, um, lethargic, they win. Right? People who are apathetic don't resist. They don't create. They don't build. And anything they birth has an issue because it was birthed out of that drug. And churches have to talk to our children, our young adults about it. It's not okay. This is the next crack that is killing generations of people of color and we need to recognize it. There's no shame. It's not a rites of passage to smoke a joint with your son. Teach him how to pull out a chair, open a door. So let's look at what the word says. So you said, well, pastor, I don't see no marijuana in the Bible. Let's look at Galatians. Can you go back and pull up that scripture again? Thank you, very good. So I want you to go to that word, sorcery, 
in some translations it says witchcraft. When you look at the Greek translation of that word, it is pharmacia. And it says, if you read it, anyone that uses or ministers drugs will not inherit the kingdom of God. And what it goes down to, you know, I said they got an A, B, C, and D definition. That it further states when I studied that when we talk about witchcraft, they say witchcraft that is used in conjunction with drugs is also, would also not see the kingdom of God. So when you incorporate that weed, that smoking in an evil practice, when you're using drugs to change how you think and see, that has a spiritual effect, so much so that they talk about in the Bible. Also in the Bible, and I didn't pull up that scripture, it talks about sobriety several times, being sober been sober of mind. Do not be drunk with wine. It talks about being sober because the enemy, says, Satan is trying to get you. He said, be sober because you are under attack. So those believers cannot be inebriated high because Satan, it makes you more vulnerable for attack. The word is clear about being sober of mind. It's clear about being drunk, and being drunk is high. It's saying it does not benefit you. Only because it's legal doesn't mean that we should be engaging in it. THC, say THC. That is the chemical that is in cannabis and weed that is addictive. That if you continue to smoke that stuff, that it can have an addictive effect on you. They will want you to believe that it does not, but that is not true. And you know it's not true because people will smoke it in spite of how people in their family feel about it. So if you're in love with your wife and you say you would do anything for her but give up the weed, that's the issue. Now women smoke weed too. Men do it at a higher rate. But you can't... Um, There's no way to sugar coat, the, sugar coat the use. So let's talk about medical use. Now there are studies that shows that marijuana can ease the pain of some conditions. Chemotherapy, you get sick to your stomach, that smoking weed can help you in that aspect. There's some that Crohn's disease, that there's some studies that shows that, that it can be some relief when my daughter was diagnosed with lupus, I read some studies about marijuana. And I thought long and hard. Right? Now, I didn't give my baby a joint. But as a mother, I had to look into every aspect that I possibly could to make sure she could be whole. You know. The issue with that, and I'm not saying don't use it if you need it. But that's not your only option. But people go to medical marijuana as though that is the only option to heal them or, or provide relief from the thing that they're sick from. I'm just saying, consider your options. But y'all know I ain't talking about when you're sick taking mar marijuana. Right? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that you're using that as a way to ease your pain instead of getting the help that you need. I'm talking about the lie that has been told to people of color that if I keep them high, that it's not going to hurt you and that you're not going to be of any effect to me. I'm talking about the generations that are being affected because it changes your sperm. So the kids that you are birthing are going to be affected by the weed that you are smoking. And that's the truth. 
Yeah, and your ovaries and your eggs. And if they are readily giving it to you, that should be the first sign. Smoke as much as you want. We'll give it to you free. It'll heal every element that you want. And we're taking it like Skittles. And our kids are watching us, smelling us, seeing it in our eyes. And we pretend that no one knows it. But we're training up generations and generations of weed heads. But we're thinking it's something that's good. But let's just be honest. It is killing us. It's not permitted in the word. Culturally, it's causing us to lose our self-respect. And medically, it may or may not benefit us the way we think it should. All I'm telling you to do is ask the question. And don't fall for the okie doke And if you are on weed and you don't know why, you have to come and ask us some questions. There's no judgment here. Then we're going to ask you some questions. And it might be a condition that we can help you fix without you being high all the time. Your anxiety is still there after you stop being high. Your depression is even greater even after you stop being high. Being bipolar doesn't dissipate. So it's a vicious cycle that someone has to tell you, I can help. And that's what we're saying to you as a church family. We can help you. You don't need that weed. It doesn't make you better. That's a lie. There's some stuff I couldn't read in this book out loud. But this was a love affair. And you're having a love affair with something that's killing you. Because people who are addicted to weed don't think it's an issue. Anybody who's addicted to alcohol don't think it's an issue. They believe that they can manage it. And it's a vicious, ugly cycle. I'm going to end with this. <sighs> Mental illness and addictions don't go away with time. Pastor and I have shared this with you, that time has never gotten permission or authority to heal nothing. So you keep waiting on time to clear your head. You keep waiting on time to take away the anxiety. You keep waiting on time to heal you from chronic depression. You keep waiting on time to change your situation. And time has never been given the authority or permission to heal nothing. That's why you can be married for 30 years and still be miserable because you wait no time to heal it. And it can't. It doesn't have the power. Time only gives you opportunity. The only thing that's going to heal your situation is work, information, and effort, and sometimes sacrifice. As a people, we were never afraid of that word sacrifice. But until we got into the world, obligation became a bad word. Sacrifice became a bad word. Hard work became a bad word. When we decided to go outside of ourselves, we understood that sacrifice had to cost us something to bring about redemption and restoration and atonement. And that's what it's going to take for you, beloveds. That you got to be willing to sacrifice something in you to not be addicted and hurting anymore. It pains me to see some of you struggling and all you have to do is ask for help. 
We speak about the unspeakable here. And more churches need to talk about this. I don't want to raise a generation of our kids who are high. Who are discontent. Who are unarmed and ill prepared. Because they're in a haze. Or because they're mentally ill and no adult cared enough to stop spanking them to see what the real issue is. Because some things you can't spank away. And you have to look at your child in the eye and figure out what is going on. And if you can't, bring them here. Get them some help. What I'm asking you to do is easier than you think. It is. It's a choice to decide that you can't do this thing called life by yourself. It's a choice to say, I'm struggling and I don't know why. It's saying, Pastor, I want to put this weed down, but it's hard. I want to stop getting drunk at night, but it's difficult. I want to stop popping pills. I want to stop hiding. I want to feel my life fully again. Beloved, you are not currently the best of who you are. That even if you are healthy and well, there's more of you that God wants you to become. Every day I ask God to make me better than I was yesterday. More loving, more powerful, more insightful, more gifted, more supernatural. Every day, because I know today I am not the very best that God has for me, even when I work hard. And the moment that we are weak, we need people around us to remind us of that. That you're not doing this life by yourself. Let's pray. Gracious God. There are people in this room. Who heard you. But didn't hear you. That even though God. You have presented them with the truth. They still believe they know what's better for them. And I'm asking, God, that your voice will be so powerful in their ear that they cannot resist the truth anymore. That your voice, God, will let them know without a shadow of a doubt that you are God and God alone. And that they don't need anything else other than you and a community of believers that believe in them. I ask right now, God, that you will begin to take the cravings out of our veins right now and the taste out of our mouths for anything that is not of God. That Holy Spirit, that you will move right now. Right now, right now, that you will move that the desires and the cravings, God, will slip off like the rain. That, God, that you will begin to continue to work and heal in their minds, God. That you will give them the courage to be their better selves. That you will give them the courage to ask for help. That healing come now. That you will clear minds that they will be able to hear the truth. I ask that you will protect our generations of children. 
I ask that you will bring back the self-respect, the shame of doing something that is just not of godly or not appropriate, that you would convict our hearts. So I speak to the bondage of that spirit of addiction and command it to die now die now die now he groshita ra basi he groshita ro basi groshita ra la god is saying that you don't need it that it's not recreational that is killing you and your family He's saying that it's a bigger issue and you can't be afraid to look at it anymore. He says that you stay in these hazes and and you're intoxicated not to look at what the real issues are because you're afraid that you're going to be judged. He says that's a lie. He said he sent you here for a reason today. He's granted you an opportunity. He says, you are loved beyond compare. Don't be afraid that the veil has been lifted. He says, the damage that you will see once the veil is lifted, don't be discouraged. Because in the horizon, if you continue to walk towards him, that you will find paradise. He grashitarabasi paradise the best of you paradise he that of us eager or she that are I see the change is coming a glorious change is coming he that of us eager or she that true healing is yours he that of us see and he said he will restore everything that that drug has cost you if you are obedient unto him he grashita robasi he said some of you got weed in your pocket purse right now he says that it needs to stay here he says do not walk out with that stuff on you he says, some of you say, I'm going to give it to my friend or I'm just going to use it as a symbol of what God has healed me. He says, no. He says, leave it on the altar. He says, leave it here. He groshita robasi. He groshita. He says, no judgment. He says, there's forever love in these walls. Forever love. He groshita robasi. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, there's a couple of things that we have to do under this anointing, so I don't want you to shift like it's time to go. We're going to do this quickly and efficiently so you can hear it and hear it clearly. If you're here and you need and you don't have a relationship with God through his son, meaning you have not accepted Christ as your savior, just raise your hand and we'll take care of you. Just raise your hand. If you'd like to rededicate your life back to Christ, okay, you've already accepted Christ. Now you want to rededicate your life back to Christ. We invite you to raise your hand. You heard the message. You heard messages. You want to rededicate. You want to reconnect. You want that power once again, his power. We invite you to raise your hand. If you'd like to be baptized, we will baptize you. If you'd like to be a candidate for baptism, we invite you to come. Just raise your hand. Just raise your hand. Those of you who are already in these categories, you need to pray for those who are, who are struggling right now. If you'd like to be a member of Emmanuel Praise Fellowship, we invite you to raise your hand. 
Now you see I'm moving quickly, but that is, that's not giving you an excuse not to respond to the Holy Spirit. You're not responding to me, you're responding to the Holy Spirit. Those invitations to have a relationship with God through his son Christ, to rededicate your life, candidate for baptism, to be a member of Emmanuel Praise Fellowship. That's on the table and it's going to remain on the table until we, until we leave. And then when we leave, it's still on the table. As Pastor Quetta was, was, was concluding her message, one of the things that's evident is that everything over the 10 years of this ministry, everything God has gave, given us to pour into these people, a reason why it hasn't reached your heart is because your heart has been covered by an addiction. It could be marijuana. It could be alcohol. So the word has to leap, go around, penetrate, fight through, and it's, in the heart, it's a heart condition. And some of us are just visual learners. I'm going to say this quick. Some of us are visual learners and you don't believe it. So let me tell you a story. I'm the youngest of seven children. Father is Cleveland Simmons. Mother is Leicester Simmons. They were married 41 years before my father passed away in 1988 with heart disease. My mother, as you know, passed away in 2015. Complication of dementia. Seven children. All by the same mother and same father. We had one mandate. No, we had several mandates. One, we had, to know, we had to know God. We had to finish school. And since my mother and father was old school from Southern Tex from um, East Texas, finishing school then was just getting your high school diploma. So they made sure. So when I graduated from high school, me and my twin, they said my job was completed because they completed high school. But if it was one thing, Diamond, one thing, Brother OG, if you really, 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 really want to get on my father's nerves, Outside of not going to church, because this was even great, not going to church, it was smoking weed. It was smoking weed. My father was a deacon. He would shout. Uh, he would wear, wear, wear the church out. But you want to hear him cuss? Smoke weed. Weed in my house, when I, if I didn't know it was weed and marijuana, I thought it was called a curse word. You've been smoking that. Anyway, that's how much he hated it and here's why I am the survivor of seven children and there's only three of us left my twin sister and my older brother my twin sister and my older brother my four siblings Vicki, Gwen, Carolyn and Charlotte Vicki, Gwen, Charlotte and Carolyn that order, order have passed away they all passed away Carolyn passed away with a thyroid issue and she died on the operating table. Something went bad during the operation. Sister Charlotte died with kidney disease. Sister Gwen died of throat cancer. Sister Vicky died of liver disease. All that started with the behavior of smoking weed. Y'all looking at me, how that can happen? Because for my sister Vicky, she started smoking weed, and in our day, weed went to angel dust. Angel dust went to crack. Y'all not hearing what I'm saying? You're trying to sit. Because we were told it doesn't pro uh, pro progress that way. In education term, it doesn't matriculate that way. Sister Gwen started smoking weed, and from, from smoking weed, angel dust from angel dust, weed, uh, weed and smoking and overly drinking throat cancer. Sister Carolyn started smoking weed, weed to some crack, to congestive heart failure. Sister Charlotte smoking weed, weed to crack, and then she didn't take her high blood pressure medication, kidney disease. My brother went to the armed service. I went to college, and I just believe my grandmother's prayers or my mom and dad's prayers just covered by Sister Karen. Sharing this with you because what I just shared with you, you your story is just the same. You have siblings that is in that, that plight now. 
We told you last week that we're going to live out loud. We have to live out loud because if we don't, we're going to hide it and we're going to continue that behavior. Pastor Lecut, I need you right now. Come on down. And Sister Bush, I need you. Sister Bridget, I need you to come forward now. We're going to pray. Come on. This way you, you're going to grow, grow up right now. Because you know what we're going to pray about. You're going to grow up right now. I want you to stand with these two. You're going to have your elder and your pastor. And this is what we're praying about. She's, she, today is going to be her last Sunday here at Emmanuel Praise Fellowship until God returns her. She's leaving to go to Las Vegas because her daughter Tiffany and brother Jerry, who used to play the drum, they moved to Las Vegas. And everybody who knows Jerry struggled with marijuana. I'm not putting this business out. Everybody knows it. Say amen if you know about that. That's my boy. I poured into him. I didn't pour marijuana use into him. He got his last paycheck about a week ago and have not been seen since. So now she's going to go cover her child. We cannot play with it, you all, because it is not playing with us. Remember last, last Sunday I told mothers, pray for sons. Y'all put Jerry on the list. That's why they praying. Now, deliverance is, is, is achieved through being courageous. I don't want to pray for you. You have to break that. I can cover you. Pastor, give you stuff. But I want right now, any type of addiction, just come to the altar and break it right now. Just come to the altar and break it right now. All you got to do is go pray. Any type of addiction, just go to the altar and break it right now. The scripture tells us, therefore, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Meaning, if he ain't going to condemn you, no need of you. Right now, right now, deliverance is at the altar for those who are courageous and want to shake the addiction of marijuana use and then everything else. Right now, right now, right now, right now. Right now, right now, right now, right now, right now. This is your time right now, right now. And I'm going to do you a favor. For those who are sitting back with your eyes open and condemning or judging, woe unto you. I'm going to protect them spiritually because they, 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 they want to re reset. They want to reset themselves. And I will not allow our human nature. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. And now for those of you, you should be out here praying for them. Because you're probably only a year, two years, three years away from breaking your addiction. Now God, now God, now God, now God. Now God, now God. Now God, now God. Hear them, Lord. You said, God, that you have given, you have already given us your divine power to live according to your word. You said, we have, Second Peter chapter 1, by your divine power that you have already given us. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think. That's including breaking the addictions. Right now, God. Right now, God. Right now, God. Even if the medication is prescribed, you're not supposed to be attacked, uh, addicted to Vicodin. Now, God. Now, God. Now, God. Now, God. Hear the cry of your people. You said in your word, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, turn from their addictions, then you
you will hear from heaven and you will heal their land. God, we're calling on you right now. Heal their land. Heal their spirits. Heal their minds. Remove the taste. Remove the, the, the landing strip of addiction from their hearts now. Now, God. Now, God. We need saints praying for them right now. Hallelujah. 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 Holy Spirit said, for the ones that didn't come forth, he, he, he's waiting on you. He's waiting on you. He's waiting on you. God is ready to give you what you've been asking him for. What he really wants you to know is that he's already given it to you. He just wants you to tap into it. Now, God, now, God. Well, pastor, it's my 15th time doing it. Well, do it a 16th time. You do it until you're righteous. And you don't stop then. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. There is deliverance in this house right now. There's deliverance in this house right now. There's deliverance in this house right now. Those of you who've been delivered, you ought to celebrate God. Let them know that God is faithful to you and faithful to his word. Those of you who've already put down the marijuana, you ought to celebrate right now. Celebrate for them. Don't celebrate in our arrogance, but you celebrate in humility that you know what it was like. Deliverance is not done in the dark. Deliverance is done out loud. Hallelujah. 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 If you receive today, let's give God a hand of praise. God bless you. 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 Let's give Pastor Laquetta a great big hand. No, no, let's stand on our feet and give her a great big hand. You don't understand being obedient to God, knowing that she, knowing that you're going to say a word that the people don't, don't want to hear. Hallelujah. We thank God for her courageous. Hallelujah. Let's remain standing and be dismissed. Can I get a little Fred, uh, a little Fred Hammond bless? As you guys leave each family, we have a little gift. Don't send your kids up to get it. We want the adults to get it. It's one per family. We're celebrating all year long, our 10th anniversary, and we just want to bless you this morning. Turn it up, band. Come on, kick it in, brother. Let me hear the drums. Come on. I know that it was kind of heavy, but it was heavy because you're blessed. Come on, church, put your hands together right there. Come on, we're going to go home celebrating that deliverance was made available for the people of God. Come on, everybody. Take it down. Gracious God, our Father, we thank you. We thank you, God, for your presence. We thank you, God, for your presence in the word. Lord, we thank you that wherever righteousness is, evil cannot reside. So from this moment forward, God, that addiction cannot reside because righteousness has taken its place. Now may the grace of God and the sweet communion of his Holy Spirit rest, rule, abide in our hearts. Henceforth, now, and forevermore, if you receive this blessing, somebody say amen. 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 Turn it up, man.